Um, so basically, the whole chat seems to mostly be about telling us about all the different kind of modeling techniques. Um, and also, more importantly, pitfalls to watch out for when you're doing modeling with regression. Um, so uh, basically, we start with a uh, really basic regression, which is um, A, which is the intercepts, um, B, I'm sorry, uh, plus B, and uh, that hasn't rendered properly, but that's meant to be a small x next to the uh, B, and the B is just um, the uh, slope of the line, and then uh, X is the error term, so whatever was not cap uh, captured by the model, which is your, resi your residuals. Now, um, they go through a number of different models and basically, um, basically explain them, um, which is you can have additive ones, which are when you've got multiple predictors, um, so, you know, I don't know, good example of that, additive model, um, oh, let's say um, a child's, um, what's it, performance at school might, would be partly a combination of their parents' uh, intelligence, their parents' actual active interest in their child in terms of, like, helping with homework, uh, and also social economic income. General, along with their parents' educational level, those those things are all kind of like uh, uh, are additive, although slightly related. They're quite they're additive. Um, Got it. Uh, whereas another example would be nonlinear models, which are like say uh, you know your log normal log normal uh, uh, models. So that's just when you basically um, put a log transformation on in there, I believe. Um, Correct. Yeah. And then, then there's like, you know, all the other ones. So there are like linear models and then there's non-additive non models, which are basically interaction term models. But you can have additive interaction term models which, which can come together. And then there's parametric and all that. And basically the end result of that is what they say is, we're only really gonna look at, um, we're only gonna look at simple models, uh, uh, additive, non-linear and uh, interaction term models. So they're not going to bother with generalized linear models, which are like, say, when you work with discrete outcome data, uh, non-parametric models, which are like ones that, where you put in like uh, polynomials uh, or degrees of freedom. Um, and they're not working with multi-level models, which are really fucking cool <laughs> and hard. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, they're not working with measurement error models. Which would be really cool because I've never actually done anything with measurement error models, but hey, you know, I suppose you've got to stop somewhere. Um, anyway, um, so let's just get a bit of data. Might as well. Um, yeah, so these are the terms. Like, so, oh, just to explain these, if you don't, if you don't understand them. Yeah, no, that's I cool. Think. That's cool, August. Oh, this part is, yeah. I'm uh, more interested in. Uh, so do R stand ARM and BRMS, like do they scale? Is BRMS just like the, the, the R wrapper on stan like functions or like what, what's the deal there? Um, they are, I think BRM, BRMS uses stan as an engine hmm. to do what it does. Gotcha, but it's like, an, it's like a wrapper around the stan part. So you don't really need to get into the nuances of how Stan is programmed and things like yeah, that. Yeah, if you if you remember, okay, I'm, I'm having a guess here because I'm not entirely sure. Might okay. be worth finding this out. But I'm guessing what they've done is, you know, when people create packages or like you know from Advanced R, where yeah. um, where you can basically create a new uh, function, mm -hmm. um, and then you can wrap all those functions into a package. Yeah. But yeah. What you can do. Uh, is you create a quotient, and inside the quotient, you can basically inherit information from other things which you pull into that quotient. So the environment, basically, you inherit the environment which you can define in your quotient, is what they're saying. Yeah, essentially, um, I, I I think that's how it's done, as opposed to them modeling it completely differently. Um, Got it. But I mean, sometimes people just steal the um, take the code and put it into their own thing, so that you don't have package dependencies. Um, Got it. Which, 
which is sensible. Um, anyway, okay, so you might have to explain something to me here because when I'm looking through the data, it makes sense when I look at their output now because I know what it means. Yeah. But when I look at the output for this, for the BRMS output, I don't really quite understand it because there's a lot more of it. Um, no, no problem, guys. I'm sure two heads are better than one. So yeah, let's look okay. at that together. Okay, so what they do here is they're basically trying to create a really simple, um, a really simple uh, regression model. Mm -hmm. And so they create the intercept, the beta, mm -hmm. and which is the uh, which is the angle of the um, slope term, the slope of the coefficient, mm -hmm. and then the sigma, which is the um, which is the error term. Okay. Correct. And then they use. They use all of that information in order to create a distribution. So basically, what oh. I'm saying is, we know we know this data already, and we're going to use this in order to create a distribution with this data. Um, and so our Hold on, one second, one second, August, one second. The, the children totally distracted me. Give me one little second. Uh, so that is an asterisk, correct? After the sigma, is that an asterisk? Yeah, it's a times. Okay, it is a times. Um, okay, so. Um, so what is the purpose of doing that? Because I know like this is going to generate a normal distribution for you with a uh, with a normalized. Um, this is a normalized distribution, but oh. Um, so, but why are they actually multiplying the error term by that? Is it because they want to have. Um, why would they multiply sigma by 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 what comes out of your R norm function? Um, well, what they're doing is, as I understand it, is so we created. You see this bit up here, uh, where it says tibble x uh, equals one to two. That's not in the above part, but it's down here. Okay. That's each kind of like if you think about it, if you look at down here, you can actually see it more easily. Yeah. 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 So what they've done here is they've then added on. They've just done. They've, all they've done is two x. Uh, so in order to create one for each level. Yeah, I think I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. Okay. A yeah, plus yeah. b, which is obviously uh, 0.5. Well, and a and b are fixed, so they can't get any. Uh, they can't change that. So that's why the the R norm term is is going to give you like just you know a random. Yes. Uh, okay, got it. Okay. So every, okay, makes sense. So every integer is. First of all, times by 0.5, right? Correct. Yeah, and then on top of that, we add um, the sigma, which gotcha. is 0.5 times yeah. um, n, which is presumably, uh, presumably whatever is on this side. So that's okay. basically x, I presume. And then the, mm, actually, I don't really understand the n, n, n in brackets part. Oh, oh, n parenthesis, is that what you're saying? What is that n, whatever? Yeah, does that just mean it's just taking that particular? Yeah, it's just term? count. I think it, it, it that's just the count of uh, uh, how many, uh, how many, uh, it's just the count of, it's kind of like count parentheses, you know, where it just does a count of what you have so far. Oh, so, so in this case, it will just be one. So it will yes. be whatever's there. Exactly. It'll be, sorry, not one. It'll be whatever is in that uh, number going in. So that's just a placeholder for x, really. I think that that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So sigma. Oh, so it's just trying to trying to say a normal. So um, zero point. Ah, oh, no, no. Oh, okay. So it's a bit different actually because this. You see the bit in brackets does it by itself. So what it's doing is um, it's doing sigma, which is point five, times. Uh, the R norm value in order to create uh, a Gaussian error term. Yeah, yeah, but I think your question was, what is the n parentheses doing? And I think it is just giving you the. To me, it seems like it's just going to be twenty because that's how much you have your table defined as. So the probably the count is like, or maybe not. I I think what it means is um, it. I I think what it means is. It will just take in that element. So rather than taking in one, two, three, or some twenty, it's 
just ah. one R norm term. So um, because it's because N like that is typically yeah. speaking uh, a count term. So it's like give me one, um, give me one time um, with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one from the 0 0.5 sigma times 0 0.5 sigma. And that's what gives you the distributed error term. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. So basically, that's just basically this simple regression formula kind of here, put into practice and yeah. with, uh, with a Gaussian error term. Correct. Exactly. Okay. So makes sense. Okay. Right. So then this splitting part is like, so now we've created what they call fake data. Um, which is fine. Um, I believe yeah. it must be called simulated data. Um, um, anyway, it says if you and I have on default settings, you can fit linear regression with um, with DRM with DRM <laughs> with DRM, which was well, I'm not sure what DRM actually stands for. And one line of code. Anyway, yeah. So D is y times D. Y is a function of x. Correct. Gives and you've got this just the name of the model, and then they've yeah. printed out. This is why I don't really understand it. So it's basically saying, I don't know, four chains, it's done 2,000 iterations, <laughs> um, and a warm up 1,000, and then thin equals one, with a post warm up 4,000 samples. So it, it basically created. 7,001 samples in order to create this distribution. Is that what it's saying? Yeah. Because that seems like a lot of, that seems like a lot uh, of simulation. Anyway. Um, well, I think, did you look up what the BRM function does? I wonder if that's like, uh, hold on. Let's see, what does the, what does the, BRM function in the BRMS package do. Okay. It performs Bayesian GLM. Holy cow. Okay. So here's what it does. Uh, okay. I'm going to just pull up the documentation. Hold on. So it's doing GLM, which of course is not for the faint hearted. Um, the prior formula, BRMS formula, you have a data frame. You have get prior. Hold on, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Let's see parameters. Threads normalize save model. Let's see what I can get. Yarnamis fit. Prior one. Count is um count is introduce of uh, what is GLM educational data import data school ID school ID formula oh you know what um August it um let me just share for one second, okay? Okay. Now, sure. Can I share? Yeah. Oh, should I stop sharing? Yeah, like two for just for two seconds. Okay. Uh, so apparently the iterations. So this is your BRM function from uh, the the package BRMS, and this is your formula which we have set. We know what the data is. Um, I'm guessing that it defaults to the logit model. Uh, but having said that, the warm up and the iterations are defined as 500 and 2000. I'm wondering if yours had specified um, the chains was four as per your model. And I don't know if that's an aspect of something that was set in your model. So uh, apparently it's a GLM model that's operating at the background. Um, it has three basic arguments that are identical to the GLM function, the formula family and data. So 
Yeah. So the family, we need to specify Bernoulli for a binary logistic regression. Um, just give me one second. Yeah, so I believe that this is a GLM template that has been set up. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea what GLM does. Uh, well, that's just um, GLM just means it's generalized linear model. Generalized so, linear model, correct. Yeah, so um, I can't remember what differences is between LM and GLM. Um, but um, I mean, a bit different with this one because this one is. Uh, was it, what was it? Logic. So it would have a, a one or zero outcome. So the um, yeah. That's why it's the logit model because it's probably a following logistic regression because you you don't you wouldn't need this to be a binomial, and it would likely default to a logit because that's like similar to um, a logistic, right? Like it's a yes or yeah. a no or whatever. So, okay, so that makes sense. Um, uh, so yeah, let me stop sharing and let's go back to your uh, presentation. So, okay, well, um, I'm probably going to ask another question in a moment um, because I'm not sure about this. Which is, um, so this is just like how it's done the sampling on the setup, right? Which is what we talked about before, um, and then made loads of iterations. It's done two thousand iterations in order to build it up. Still not entirely sure what post all of the samples. Anyway. Um, uh, the population effects are written down as this is the intercept at 0 0.25. Now, I can remember the intercept was 0 0.2. Oh, so that's not that far off. Yeah, that's not that far off, is it? 0 0.25. And then, oh, this is your beta. So this is the effect of x on y, which is 0 0.3. And if we go back up here, it is actually 0 0.3. So it's pretty close to what was, um, yeah. Okay. Exactly. So then, um, then we've got this down here, the sigma value, which is um, our error term, which is 0.5. Um, I think that's what that means, because it is written as sigma. Now, what I don't really understand is this stuff. Like, well, I understand the upper and lower confidence intervals. So that's where we would see uh, we expect to see lowest value or the highest value. Uh, we expect to see whether our true population is within those, those to 95% confidence. What I understand is the bulk ES and the tail ES and the rat. 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 Is, uh, is that like a coefficient, uh, correlation coefficient, like the R square? Um, I mean, R squared is a correlation coefficient. So maybe this is like the measured correlation coefficient, which is one, which is, wow. Um, that would mean it's a perfect correlation. That's hard to believe. So I'm yeah. not sure if that is correct. And the image of it is in perfect correlation. So ah, maybe, wow, okay. Um, I guess that's something that we'd need to understand. Um, and then bulk ES and tail ES, I'm not really sure what those two are, but it must be descriptions of the variables, uh, well, sorry, I'm... certainly param well, these are all parameters. <laughs> Interesting that bit about effects, because if we go, if you just to go through the book, one of the things it talks about is not to use a term effects. Um, and we'll get to that in a second, actually. Um, but anyway, so. This is actually pretty close to what we've got in our um, in our parameters up here. Because these are the true parameters. Uh, and it's basically given us pretty similar and within, and it's well within our confidence intervals, as you can see. Um, you know, the true, because the, the true number is 0. 0.5. Yeah, and, that and it falls up. within your, yeah, correct. Well within it. Oh, uh, wait, this bit. Uh, samples were drawn using. That's the bulk ES has our effective sample size measures. The R hat is a potential scale reduction factor on split chains. 
Mm-hmm. So basically, what I'm saying is we haven't split it. There's no convergence. Hmm. Not really sure about that. Anyway, um, the summary function yields the same result, but if you desire the summary to summarize the location of the median and the spread, mad, you can set robust to true. All right, so this gives us the um, the mad instead. So just a variance in your thing, in your. Yeah. Where do you set the robust to be true, uh, August? Where is oh, that option? So when you put. Oh, oh yeah, 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 okay. Got it, got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is robust true. And apparently that changes things, but I can't see where. Oh, look, oh, there you go. Slight differences in numbers. So your sigma is a little bit lower. Yeah, 0.1. Yeah, mm-hmm. Slightly. And so the parameters there. And these parameters are slightly different as well because it's using the mean, but because it, you know, because it simulates data and it's two thousand samples, the means, the mean and the median are going to sit pretty similar, really close to each other. Anyway, um, we can also extract uh, summaries from A and B coefficients using fixed f. Um, oh, so he's taking us through how to like pull out the coefficients here, which is pretty cool. So. Um, so there's the estimates directly. So if you wanted to, for instance, rebuild something like a, a regression model, I've had to do this before in the past, where you basically build a regression model and then pull out the coefficients. You can kind of do this kind of thing. And then, so you would leave that, but then, then on top of that, you could put like, say, a bracket, uh, a square bracket here and put, yeah. say, one, one, and it will pull out this particular bit. And then what, and then, one, two, you pick out this, right? No, wait, is column on the right or left? No, it doesn't matter. So, yes, yeah, you're right. That's exactly what it is. And okay, then you can do a GG plot with the uh, intercept. Oh. Yeah, so then what is showing us here is this is just what a simple linear regression looks like, pretty straightforward. And if I was the coefficients, nothing Got really. It. Fancy, really. I mean, pretty close to what you had all started with your predictions point. You, you started with point two and point three, I believe, and um, as your A and B, and here you have um, point two, five, and point three. So pretty close. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, and then you have the sub plot, and then you have the data and the regression line. I mean, yeah, okay, sounds good. Comparing yeah, yeah. estimates to assumed parameters. Yeah, so. Um... Wait, uh, yeah. did you go past that? Because, because, oh yeah, right, okay, so next part. So uh, this is how he's just creating, here what he's doing is creating a table because what they do is they basically repeat it. Oh, got it. So, so it's basically like, if you run the regression several times. Got it. With the same parameters, what do you get? So, um, so the assumed parameter, this is the assumed parameters or actually the true parameters that we know that they are. These are the- Well, the actually, true. I mean, those are not true, right? Like it's not a, it's not empirically defined. It's, um, I mean, the, that point two and point three was just based on, like, it was not a, I mean, it's true. Okay, I guess it's true in a sense that that's what it's you true. had said. It was true in this particular case. Okay, true. yeah, okay. Uh, see, oh, true, for me. But anyway, okay. like, if we look at the, um, the spread, the spread is still, 5.7 in the book it's um 4.3 and then well, but then sigma the is not the same definition of sigma as we understand it because here the sigma is the error term isn't it so is that also considered um a spread here uh or oh okay so yeah no sorry so it is the spread i'm sorry okay yeah yeah it's the spread um okay. but the uncertainty here is 0. Uh, 0.1 and then 0.2 so everything's within everything is within uncertainty if it is over, which is in this case, it's only really sigma that's actually um, over the uh, the assumed value. So um, that which is really quite good. Anyway, so um, it, so interpret coefficients as comparisons, not effects. So, oh yeah, so this is what you're saying. It's like. Can't compare. You can't. Um, you shouldn't interpret something as um, 
as an effect. And the reason for that is because people get confused with this. So in the example, this is data that's actually from uh, the ROS exam uh, examples. And they create an earnings, um, <laughs> an earnings uh, value. And then, um, where is that? Um, yeah. Okay, it's here. Okay. It's just by 1,000, just to make the numbers easier, I presume. Something okay. Like uh, this time we'll add a couple more arguments for the BRM function. The seed argument will make the results more reproducible. Okay. Oh, yes, there you go, that he's put in there. Oh, so he's put in directly. The file argument will automatically save the bit as an external file. Why would you do that? Yeah. No, no, please. Uh, sorry, uh, Argus, give me one second. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Robert. Go ahead. Okay, um, so they save it as an external file. Uh, okay, any idea file. why they've divided the earnings by, is it just because they don't want it to be like wildly out of, um, you know, like for it to be like a really huge value? Is that why they have actually scaled it by dividing it by a thousand? I'm not entirely certain really. Um, I mean, it makes it easier to compare, I suppose. It's, it's smaller numbers, smaller numbers are easier to see than the difference than bigger numbers. Okay, gotcha, mm -hmm. okay. But, it wouldn't change the sum of squares value. It should not, uh, yes, that's correct. Oh wait, they're not using sum of squares. Um, but still, um, anyway, so the reason, okay. so what they're saying is, um, what are the earnings related to height and sex? Um, so, um, so what are the effects of these coefficients? So what we're seeing here is an estimate of an increase in height uh, the intercept starts at you earn is it thousands, twenty six thousand. People start off with negative twenty six thousand. Twenty six hundred. Twenty six hundred. Yeah, yeah. So you that's that's how much you make if you if you didn't have any. That's correct. Yeah. And the, and the height and for every piece of height. Uh, sorry, for every height increase. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's because the intercept starts at uh, zero and nobody is of zero height. So every, for every centimeter increase in height or inch, uh, one's earnings increase by $700. Well, actually, uh, decreased because it's one over one over it's seven over 10. So it actually dropped by that, right? Uh, it, it increases because it's additive. Mm, wait, hold on. Uh, for one unit increase in height, okay, your your yeah, okay. Sorry, yes. For every unit increase in height, your pay increases by 0. 0.7. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and for for the male, it's. Uh, oh. oh, and if you're male, you get an additional. Uh, Ten point six. Ten thousand. 10, yeah. 10. 6, the, this data is quite old. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think it's 1999. The thing is, male is a categorical variable, right? So has it actually set the baseline as female? Like, I mean, or does yeah. that only have, if it's categorical, it mm -hmm. establishes the, yeah, isn't that right? Like since F, F comes sooner than M, your female becomes um, the baseline. So every a male makes 10,000 more than the female for yes. everything else being the same, correct? Yeah, yeah, because uh, female is coded as one, sorry, zero, and that male is coded as one. So if you have a uh, male, then you've got 10, 000, plus 10,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, sounds good, correct, you're right. So the so, male, yeah. And then you've got a sigma of twenty. Yeah. You've got yeah. a sigma of twenty of two thousand one hundred. Mm -hmm. Is that right? No, it's not. It's twenty one thousand four hundred, which is huge. That's a variance. Holy cow! That is that's a standard deviation, right? Sigma yeah, is. I think this is the point. So the point is, rounding and ignoring the uh, estimates for e, we can use this as, to express the line as. Uh, uh, intercept of minus two, uh, two, two, six point two, uh, plus, 
0 0.7 for every increased inch in height times, did I do an interaction term? Not times height. Well, there is no interaction term, correct? Because oh, it's sorry, one... this, this is times height, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, sorry, that's, that's for every- That's just the coefficient, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then this is, um, what's it, male, essentially. Uh, yeah, because the, the, yeah. What is the error term on the male? I'm just curious. One point. 7,000, blah, 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 plus also this as well. Anyway, um, that's quite, that's quite considerable. Anyway, um, the estimate for sigma in our print, printout, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the estimate for sigma in the printout is just 21.4 of urn k values will be within plus or minus 21.4 of the lines. That's about 64% of the time. And within two standard deviations, which is 42.8 thousand, can you please tell me that like I'm a three-year-old? That did not make okay. sense. Okay, right. So, um, so basically, what it's saying is that um, that any of our estimates will be within um, uh, will be within so sixty-four one standard deviation is sixty-four percent of the data, right? So twenty so. Within one standard deviation, there can be a variance plus or minus from the from the score of an individual of twenty one point four, and if we are at the extremes, which is uh, two standard deviations, then the variance can be as much as forty two point eight uh, difference from the actual uh, value of the individual. From the predicted value, that is. That makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, we get these uh, percentiles based on the conventional assumption. I don't know why that's conventional. So it would have to be mean zero and standard deviation one, right, for you to make that um, assumption of sixty-eight uh, percent and ninety-five percent, correct? You would have um, to. Have this kind of a normal distribution. It's just, your mean would have to be zero, yeah. Um, but that's what standard deviation does, it turns everything into standard value. And so everything comes from the mean or median. And so um, plus or minus the, if we take the mean value up here, which we don't have. In fact, actually, maybe it shows it just below. Oh, have you not done those graphs? Oh, we have done the graphs, there we go. Oh no, that's a, that's a different thing. The, po the point that he's trying to make here in the book, or they are trying to make in the book, is that there's such a massive amount of range that we can't say this is an effect. What we can say is that on average, um, on average, a 0 0.7 uh, inch increase in height is associated with a 0 0.7 increase in um in pay or earnings um to, does not have a sigma function if you want to come out with the point estimate for it will probably be easiest to use the superior sum that's not easy so that is the sigma oh that's to pull out the sigma value oh and this is really important so actually so you know we're talking about r squared before so in the book, what they do to show that this isn't very good is what they say is um, is the R squared value. So that's because one of the things that these don't point out, this summary doesn't point out is how much of the data does this model account for, or how much variance does it account for. Well, it's actually 0 0.98, so it's about so 0 0.1, so it's 10. 10% 10 of the data is accounted for by our model. And the way how you do that is you take the uh, you take the you take one and you minus sigma of the model squared divided by the standard deviation wait model fit hmm. 
are you saying that only 10% of our data is explained by this? That's like a remarkably small. Yeah, that, that, that's essentially what happens. What I find a bit weird is this, like they can, you put, I did, I've never seen this before, but you can put the whole model in there. So you take the posterior sum, you put the model object in there, not a piece of the model object. And then what you do is you pull out the sigma and you square it. Oh, which is the amount of variance. Oh yeah, you do. Yeah, so you pull out the sigma of the model and you square that. Uh, so that, that's basically your model's variance. And you divide that by the standard deviation of earnings, which is the actual values. So this is, these are the model about the sigma and that's the actual values. So basically, your linear model accounts for 9% of the variance in earnings in the data. No, yeah, not 10%. 10%, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, because the linear model has a variance of whatever, which is this bit on the side. So this is the variance the model has, yeah? And we're squaring that and we're dividing that by the square of the standard deviation as calculated from the parameter, from the, um, of the actual, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for here? Jesus, I can't be brain fried. Um, the outcome variable, we're calculating the, the actual deviation itself directly. So we know what the deviation is and we're squaring that. So ignoring the squaring part, we're taking the actual variance and comparing it to what the model's variance is and say it's seeing how different that variance is in terms of size. I was on mute all this time, August. I'm such a dork. Um, Sorry. 
how did they say on page 84 that the error in this model is not even close to being normally distributed? How did they arrive at that, that the errors on page 84? How did they, yeah, so how do they know on page 84 that the errors are not normally distributed? Well, the thing is, I mean, the best thing, the best thing to do, I mean, hang on, let's see if we can do this. So if we, if we pick up, uh, what is it called? If we actually get into the data itself. Um, so where is the data, 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 data bands. Right. Uh, I'm gonna put exams, exams. I wonder if I can open a new script to see what it did. Go to exams. Where am I getting that from? It's getting it from. Oh, wait. It's data. No, no. Let me just grab that. Hmm. So basically what they're saying, August, here is that you cannot assume that the coefficients can be interpreted as effects. So you cannot say that your height has, the estimated effect of height is $600 because that is the coefficient that you get for height. And the coefficient that you get for the gender is 10,600. It's inappropriate to label these as effects, at least not without a lot of assumptions, because an effect is the change associated with some treatment or intervention. So to say that the effect of height on earnings is $600 is to suggest that if you were to increase someone's height by an inch, then it would increase by an expected amount of $600. But that is not really what's being estimated from the model. What is observed is an observational pattern that taller people in the sample have higher earnings on average. Yes. These data allow for between person comparisons, but to speak of effect of height is effect of height is to reference a hypothetical within person comparison. I see. So how then can we think of the coefficient? We say that under the fitted model, the average difference in earnings comparing two people of the same sex, but one inch different is 600. So it's a comparison. It's not an effect, but it's a comparison. Somehow I would have never thought that they were, there was a difference in those two, but apparently there is. Um, yeah, I suppose it's a bit like uh, ANOVA really to think about it. Um, you know, you use an ANOVA comparison rather than for prediction. So it's, you can think of it as in, interperson comparison, but not really like make any broad sweeping strokes of effect of that particular, um, right? Yeah, you, I, I think what I was saying is be careful when you, uh, when you make, when you're saying that something has an influence on something else, because it might be that, that you can compare two things and say, well, the earnings between these individuals based on height or on gender does exist, but that the effect itself, we can't be certain of what the actual effect is per individual. So as a consequence, we can say that on average, there is a difference. So I think that's true of any model, right? It's not only because here it only explains 9% of the variance. Is it because that the explained variance is so low that we have to be careful? Or is it in general that you can never extrapolate your the coefficient to also mean effect? Is that true in general, August? Or is it only in, for? In the past, if I had seen uh, R squared value that, because I would use the frequency approach, um, the frequency approach, probably said something along the lines of this isn't an effect 
Um, although, having said that, there are clear differences in IQ between, like, well, between different groups, cultural groups, for example, um, and that tends to be a consequence of um, those effects seem to be quite very small, but exist more likely because of the education in which the different cultures come from, not necessarily because of the cultures themselves. Um, so, for instance, suppose a good example is right. if you're someone from uh, Congo and you come across to, say, France, uh, your, you, your educational background is going to be quite different and that, that will affect how you perform on an IQ test um, or something along those lines, not necessarily your actual internal IQ, because even though it does measure IQ within, say, the French population, it wouldn't do so very well with someone who's come from outside that education because they've got such a um, missing gaps in their education by comparison, I suppose. So, I mean, if you have done IQ test, you know, half, like a load of questions are in English grammar, so, um, if they're English tests, they're different when they're going to be something else. So you're not going to be able to answer those correctly because you just don't have that about knowledge, um, which is not the point. Anyway, um, no. this was really great. I mean, I um, I feel like, you know, I've seen this kind of uh, equation like all my life and probably have been calling it like, uh, probably have been interpreting those coefficients like completely, you know, inaccurately as, I mean, even without realizing that I was thinking of it as an effect, I must have sub subconsciously. Uh, so this is really awesome that it says the last sentence, regression is a mathematical tool for making predictions. Regression coefficients can sometimes be interpreted as effects, but they can always be interpreted as um, average comparison. So yeah, so that's that's good to know. It's kind of like how I had to change my verbiage of the p-value and what is considered significant and not significant and how rejecting one doesn't mean that the other one is true. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's kind of like that. It's subtle, but then if you don't know it, then you're just being like, you know, completely uh, oblivious to. Okay, that's great, uh, uh, August. Thank you so much. This was so helpful. The business science guys put a, um, what's it, a meme up yesterday. Um, on LinkedIn or something like that, and it shows this um, Switzerland football fan uh, looking kind of distraught because of, um, I think it's in an England-Switzerland game, it was like 1-0 to England, and then Switzerland score a goal, and the fan's taking his shirt off and he looks, you know, ecstatic kind of thing, and the, in, the one, in the one where he's not looking happy, it says P equals 0. Uh, um, 0 0.05, and in the other one, it says P equals 0 0.049. <laughs> it's kind of like, well, yeah, that's about right, isn't it? Um, anyway, um, right, let's try to crack on with this a bit quicker now, because uh, like we get, we've got past the main, main bits, really. The R squared part, I think, is just showing us you've got to be very careful in interpreting your data, particularly when, it does, when your model doesn't account for much of the data that's gone into it. If it counted for a lot more data, I think we could be we could be more kind of like confident that there was an effect rather than just something to use in comparison. And I think that's why people tend to prefer larger effect sizes. Um, you know, if I don't see large effect size, I typically speaking, wouldn't consider it to be worth mentioning. But having said that, like I say, there are small differences that exist and they will only make up a small amount of explainability. But your model to be good probably needs to explain more, which means you need to capture more data and throw in those, those other explanation parts in order to add it all together. Which, you know, you can never have a perfect model. Anyway, right, so uh, let's get down to historical stuff about Galton. Galton? He was, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, um, Darwin's cousin. Um, and he was really into eugenics, which is rubbish. Um, but, you know, as a former neuroscientist, I'm appalled that one of the fathers of, um, the fathers of uh, statistics was a eugenicist. Um, but, like, anyway, I believe it was popular for a short period of time, not permanently. But anyway, the point is, uh, Galton talked about regression, which is defined as a process or an instance of progressing to a less perfect or less developed state. How did this term come from, uh, probably used from a statistical perspective? 
connection between Francis Galton, one of the original quality, quantitative social scientists who fit linear models to understand the hereditary of human height, predicting children's height. He noticed that the children of tall parents tend to be taller than average, but less small than their parents. And the children of small parents tend to be smaller on average, but taller than their parents. Thus, from one generation to the next, people's heights have regressed to the mean. What does that mean? What that means is, if you're at the extremes, you tend to move towards the middle. Essentially, that's, 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 that's what it means. So if you, if you are, for instance, the uh, performing really high in exams compared to, uh, in one exam compared to your uh, peers, your next exam, you're likely to actually be more closer to average, even if you're still higher in general. Um, to which this goes into later, but, but let's just talk about this quickly. Okay, so the um, the heights, rest to mean, blah, 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 low heights, dot text. Uh, yeah, anyway, so basically we've got the heights for mothers and daughters, which uh, we could do simple correlation uh, article if we wanted to, but essentially what this shows us is there's a massive spread and you can see the ones which are really high. These are the mother's height over here. So there's not very many of these, but if you look, their daughter's heights tend to also be high, but they are more likely to be lower down on the scale. So typically speaking, as the mother height increases, so the daughter's height, but it will be closer to the middle. Okay, um, so what's the model? They put out a model here. Uh, oh. Yeah, so you use ordinary least squares in order to pull out a model. So that's just uh, some squares value instead. So pick out the intercept, which then move towards the middle because that's the average height, as opposed to using of 29.79 inches, compared to the, and for every inch increase in mother's height, we expect. Hey, um, August, are you still there? Because I can't hear you now. Sorry? Uh, I couldn't hear you for like about the last minute. I think it, your your screen was frozen. Oh, okay. So can you uh, can you just explain the inter intercept and the mother's height part again? Um, the, what I've done is they move the intercept over to the middle. And the reason why they do that is because the line of best fit uh, or the line moves What's the phrase? The it doesn't. It's not logical to have the intercept at zero because no one is a height of zero. So you you make the intercept the midpoint instead. So for every increase or decrease in mother's height, you get one uh, zero point five five in or decrease in. Uh, um, in the daughter's height, basically. And what that means is there's, why that's important as well, is that there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between the mother's and daughter's height. So that's important to remember, which is the variance in mother's height can't be, you know, means that actually it's more likely the daughter's height when they're higher is going to be, um, going to be less. And the same thing for if it's the other way around, if you look at the mother's height where they're really low, typically speaking, all the daughters, they're up here. And so they're actually quite a bit higher than the mothers. Um, it's quite strange to have sort of 50 centimeters, seems, 50 inches seems very short. Um, but that is the 1800s, so they're probably malnourished. Um, as you may have noticed, uh, our tricky code, the on point data dot blah blah. Yeah, that's how we plot the grand mean of two variables. They do. Oh, that's how they plot it. Oh, so to create the grand mean, right? So this is the grand mean. So it's the one between the two means. So what you're saying, they didn't just use a normal mean; they used the grand mean of the of the two uh, of the two variables. So they did that by taking taking the data. 
I'm summarizing that. Um, summarizing that. Hmm. Oh, so they got mean and mean. Yeah, yeah. So basically, all it is is a mean of two means, right? Which I believe is acceptable. <clears throat> Which is this. Anyway, uh, now we're ready to make this figure, uh, which we don't really need to explain, to be honest. But that's just basically the coefficients, and that's where the gram mean is. Um, basically, it's something you can insert from the slope. Yeah. So, what this is essentially just saying, oh, here we go. So, what they're showing here is how half of the daughters um, who have tall mothers are below the height of the mothers sorry are above and half them below so that means that it's likely you're just as likely to regress uh oh there's a really important point here hang on let me get it out uh, when comparing the height of two people the same height but different sex no, oh no wait to summarize oh no wait oh that's the same one as what you did right hang on there we go Instead, we can use a different equation for the line of effect, centering at zero, blah, blah. Uh, to put this into context, if a mother has average height, her daughter is predicted to have um, average height. And then, if for each inch taller a mother is, is or shorter, then the average is then than the average, her daughter is expected to be half an inch taller or half an inch shorter than the average of her generation. Um, uh, and that's not the phrase I was looking for. Skipping model. Okay, um, if you do these steps of saying you'll find the graph of this one. Oh, that's it. Oh, paradox to me. Yeah, uh, so he doesn't talk about it. Oh, I, hang on. Oh, so it just creates this. Oh, right, so it's here. This is the important bit. Paradox. Uh, the previous height of women is closer to the average. Compared to her mother, the actual height is not the same. Yeah, the predicted height of a woman is closer to the average compared to her mother's height, but the actual height is not the same thing as the prediction, which has error. Recall equation 6.1 has the error term in it, the, um, the point prediction regresses towards the mean, that's the uh, regression less than one, and this reduces variation. Uh, the point predictions regress towards the mean, that's the coefficient less than one. Uh, I don't quite understand that sentence. Um, at the same time though, the error in the model the imperfection of the prediction adds variation. Oh, I see. So what it's saying is um, the point prediction regresses towards the mean. That's the coefficient less than one, and this reduces variation. So the coefficient reduces variation because as we as we get an understanding of the coefficient, it reduces the variation. However, at the same time, though the error in the model the uh, imperfection of the prediction adds variation. So if we're not, if our variation not, that we capture in the model isn't very good, it will add variation. Just enough to keep the total variation in height roughly consistent from one generation to the next. Yeah, so the whole point is, if everyone's regressing or like, you know, tall people getting more likely to be smaller than their mothers and short people are too likely to be taller, everyone should eventually meet in, to be average, right? But, but they don't. And the reason why they don't is because of the variation in the actual population and the variation prediction. So people don't actually regress down towards the mean because there is variation that accounts for the changes between one individual and the next. If that makes any sense. It seems difficult. I think it's quite a difficult concept. Um, I, I, I struggled with it yesterday. I still yeah, struggle. it is. Uh, that is, oh, so he's written something here. That is, the paradox around the regression to the mean is only a paradox when people focus too much on the mean structure 
of the model and ignore the variability around the mean. Consider when we simulate data using uh, the R norm function, the shape of the resulting distribution is controlled primarily by the mean and standard distribution parameters. Don't forget the standard deviation. Well, I think what they're trying to say is that um, not to focus on the model as much as you need to actually look at how a mean has its own variance. I think so. I, I think it's all about what, uh, what they're trying to say is that if you interpret a model as its average performance, you will misunderstand the model itself, which is the variation around the mean of the model. Um, and that's what you need to account for when you're saying how a model is performing and what it's telling us about uh, the relationship between um, predictors and outcome variables. Um, so this one is probably a better example. Um, so what they do is they take test results and we create these test results ourselves. So we create 1000 test results and we create numbers of their true ability. And then we add in a noise variable. The noise variable is zero with a standard deviation of 10, right? But it's based on an R norm. So some people can have a variation of say uh, two standard deviations below their actual ability. Yes. So bearing in mind, we've got 1,000 people. There's a mean value of 50% on a test with a standard deviation of 10. Well, then if we add in this other deviation of 10, well, say there are two standard deviations in true ability heights, so they're about say 70. Well, they could, they could easily um, have a standard deviation below by 20 points lower. So they could perform at the average even on one test. So if they do te two tests, a midterm and the final exam, and we use the midterm to predict the final exam, we get um, a relationship between um, the, the intercept is the average score, the intercept is the score of 27.23 and a midterm for each point scored in the midterm, there's a 0 0.45 increase on the intercept. But the variation is 12, which makes sense because the, um, what's it, because this, the, the variance in the noise is, uh, what's it called, is 10 points. So if we look here, what we're saying is, actually how people perform in the midterm, realistically speaking, isn't necessarily related to how they perform in the exams. Although there is some measure of their actual performance, there's a lot of variation around that that's not accounted for. Um, so it describes it here. The regression parameter described above is a particular example of misinterpretation of the comparison. The key idea here is for causal inference, you should compare like with like. The midterm performance essentially it does not predict the final exam performance, is what they're trying to show. And that's it. That, 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 that's, the, that's the whole chapter, realistically speaking. Um, oh, I, th I think this is probably a really good example, right? So, in the book, so I've read this in Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. In the book, there's, this is a famous example from some psychology experiments. So, <clears throat> instructors in a flight school adopted a policy of consistent positive reinforcement recommending, so, recommended by psychologists. They verbally reinforced each successful execution of a flight maneuver. After some experience with this training approach, the instructors claimed that contrary to the psychologist's doctrine, high praise for good execution of complex maneuvers typically resulted in a decreasement of performance in the next attempt. The interpretation of this is regression is inevitable in flight maneuvers um, because performance is not perfectly reliable to progress between successive maneuvers, uh, sorry, 
and progress between successive moves is slow. And pilots who did well on one trial are likely to deteriorate on the next, regardless of the instructor's reaction to their initial success. The experienced flight instructors actually discovered the regression, which is that um, that they did that, um, that anyone who performed well on maneuver did badly on the next one, but actually reduced it to the detrimental effect of the positive reinforcement. So basically, what they're saying is. Because someone performed well on a flight maneuver when they're training, because the, because um, when they're training, there's so, you know they're not the uh, improvement in performance is so slow and takes so long that it's likely that between the next the next try they won't perform it as well. Like um, I don't know if you've ever like swung a baseball bat, the first time you do it and connect the ball, you might do it really really well, but then the next time you do it. Um, you might completely miss it or miss swing. That's um, my, my cricket playing was a lot like that back in the day. Um, but the point is, is that your performance between one, th one swing of being, the ball being thrown at you when you're first learning and the second swing aren't related because even if you're able to hit it well in one go in your first few attempts, the next one might not, the next good, good hit might not come for another 10 tries. And that's a good example of what regression to me, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, this that well, that was great. Um, August, that was really good. It's I, I think I think that it's a difficult concept because I forget this one all the time. Um uh, the, yeah, the paradox of the regression to the mean. Is So I have one question uh, on page 88, where it says the point predictions regress towards the mean. That is the coefficients are less than one and this reduces variation. Is there any reason why that would reduce variation on page 88? Yeah, I'm looking at that one myself actually. The resolution of the apparent paradox is that yes, if the cycle woman is closer to average compared to her mother's height, but the actual height is not the same thing as the prediction, it's an error to call equations. The point predictions regress towards the mean. That's the coefficient less than one. Well, I think here's what it is. If it regresses towards the mean, then you're obviously it's going to lie on that line, and so there will not be a correlation coefficient because it's on the mean, correct? So there will not be any R. It's it's going to be closer or lesser than one. So R one is perfect correlation. That means they're yeah. perfectly correlated, but if it lies on that 50% line or whatever that line is, or um, since it's actually moving closer to the mean where we don't assume there's any difference or any observed difference, then your coefficient would be less than one. And so there is no variation. I think it's something like that. I think yeah. I kind of get it, but I'm not sure. The point predictions regress towards the mean. That's the coefficient that's less than one. Oh, is that, so you can ignore that part because that means because what it's just saying is the coefficient, which is uh, zero point five five. So they're just saying that's the. That coefficient. basically means that is that basically means it's random. Like there is no there is no correlation. Like point five means that it's it's a random chance, right? So the closer you move to the center and you're not closer to one, that means it's a random chance and not really a correlation. So that's what it means when it says that you are reducing the variance. Mm. Correct? Because that's more along the lines of what? Uh, if it you don't have- it, it works in this case. If it was something else, it wouldn't work. Um, like if we were talking about Because the, it's the same measure as the outcome predictor. If we were talking about comparing, like, say, inches with um, household earnings, for instance, it wouldn't work. 
because you so if your earnings were using it being used to predict height, then you'd have like a thousand to one. And if you had one in that in the um, coefficient column, it wouldn't be a what it'd be it would mean like a one dollar increase or one pound increase, but not a one inch increase. Not sure, inch. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but in this case, it does work because it's showing us. Actually, yeah, so I suppose that is kind of what it's, the whole point of this. So it's one to one ratio, so that you can show that there's an imperfect relationship between the coefficient and the actual performance, so that there is as much as 45% variation. Yeah, roughly speaking. So, oh, so what it's saying is. Oh, I've got it, I've got it. So what it's saying is the coefficient uh, reduces the variance because it is explaining data. But we have a lot of data that's not explained. And so that's what adds variation to our models. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's hard. <laughs> what, I, what I would like to see is if there was like, um, I would like the answers to the questions. Well, I think I learned a lot. It's, it, it's pretty good. <clears throat> I, I, I do think that the best thing to do is just to um, read the chapters and then to just, because um, I've forked all the, um, all of the um, markdown files. So I think the best thing you could do is just like go through the markdown files after reading each chapter. I think that probably covers most of it. And then we'll, Typically speaking, remember the main talking points as we go through. Um, I think I think this was awesome. I'm actually going to read through this chapter again, um, and I'll post in Slack things which I still find confusing, which I do. But I think we covered it, and I think you did an awesome job. So, thank you very much. Uh, if this uh, attendance continues, then I might have to present the next one. <laughs> like, just do it alternatively. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's just a two for it. I think, I think we can get through the book slowly but surely. And I think if we just read it, and at least if we just read the chapter and then just go through these, um, through these markdowns, we'll get towards the end without having to, you know, what we normally do is create a whole presentation. Yeah, and the focus should not be the presentation. It's really the discussion and the fact that there's more than one pair of eyes looking at it, and it always helps to, you know, figure things out easier that way. So. If anything, this makes the content of this little less um, unfamiliar. Like even if I may not have understood all of it, it still makes it less unfamiliar. And that's already a good start in my opinion. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you and for going through me because definitely, I definitely wouldn't be able to get through it by myself. No, well, you did a great job. So uh, thanks. I am making up half this as I go along. <laughs> All right, well, see you, see you next. Bye. Okay, see you next time. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your day.